great DVD series for the bookstore pick of the month and great stuff in the cafe. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians 11. We're looking at the first 15 verses. Title of our study this morning, Transformers. I won't ask, but I know it's possible. You were driving by the theater. You saw the sign. It says Transformers. You're like, isn't there a new Transformers coming out? And so here you are. And now you realize, oh, my gosh, there's not going to be a movie at all. And there certainly won't be Transformers as a movie. Well, listen, if that's the situation and you really got to get, go now. But uh, if you stay, then you've got to stay. And so uh, we didn't put it up there to trick anybody. It just happens to be the title of the study. Now, there are actually a couple different types of Transformers. There's the really cool kind like in the movie. And then there's the kind that you buy your kids at Christmas where you either need an engineering degree to make it happen or you need a three-year-old to show you how it works. I've got neither. Well, I actually have no engineering degree. I do have a three-year-old grandson, though, so I could probably get him to show me how it works. Paul, though, is a dealing with and addressing a dealing. That's Italian for addressing. But uh, he's dealing with spiritual transformation. And he shows us there are two kinds of transformers, those who were being transformed and those who were transforming themselves. The first were experiencing the work of God. That's your situation. If you're born again of the Spirit of God, if you're growing in Christ, you are being transformed by the renewing of your minds. That's why we're in the Word at every service. We worship and we study, we pray, we worship, we study, we pray. Why? That's how God transforms us. The second, well, it was the work of man. It was God's thing or it's man's thing. The first group, and I pray you're in it, and if not, you will today change all that. The first group are walking with God, walking in the light, walking in truth, walking in love, becoming more like God in the process. The second, well, they were actors, frauds, fakes, posers. What did they call them? Hodads. That's what they called the surfers before they called them posers. But it goes back to the 50s and it called the 70s. I don't know what they call them now. But in any case... These guys, um, false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, walking in darkness, walking in deception. And, well, Paul deals with both. The chapter begins, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. This section, as we pointed out in chapter 10 last time, it goes back and forth from personal testimony to serious concerns. Paul shares here a very serious concern. Then he'll deal with a bit of personal testimony and get back to his serious concerns. He considers it folly to have to, well, validate himself. We saw this in the last chapter. Those who opposed Paul, well, they had letters from Jerusalem. They were important people, and he'll talk about them and the difference between him and them. He says, I want you just to bear with me for a moment. Indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Couple concepts immediately. Jealousy and godly jealousy. Now, I've experienced both early on. When I first knew Pam, I actually was, well hanging out with another gal that I was really attracted to, and then Pam kind of came on the scene, and they became best friends. The gal that I liked didn't actually like me, but she didn't want to, you know, tell me. And so she, she could see that Pam liked me, and she thought, I have a perfect plan. I'll make this guy jealous. How did she do it? Well, a double date at the drive-in. The problem was I wasn't invited on the double date. And so I started thinking about it, and I was so mad that she set it up, but I was even more distressed and more disturbed that Pam was at a double date at a drive-in of all places with another guy. And I realized that day what Debbie, my, uh, you know, hopeful girlfriend, what, what she realized, 
we were never going to be together because she was like, no way. And, uh, and, and, but Pam, yeah. And so here's the deal. That wasn't exactly godly jealousy, but it was a picture of jealousy. It caused me, and it shows how God can use a negative thing to, to, to work a good thing. It caused me to realize that Pam was the one I really cared for. Pam was the one I wanted to woo. I can't tell you in all honesty that I loved her. I told her I did, but I didn't even know what love was back then. Now that I understand what it is, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry I ever even used that word to describe how I felt toward you. Because what I feel toward her today is so much more radical and wonderful and eternal. Well, all of that to say there is godly jealousy. And Paul is... Well, using this term because he says, I've betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Listen, if you're a dad or a mom and you have daughters especially, you know what it is to have a godly jealousy. Fellas, let me tell you, when someone comes to, well, meet your daughter or woo your daughter or wants to take your daughter out, you first of all, give them the evil eye. Let them know that you've got your eye on them. It doesn't hurt to have a gun over the the mantle. It doesn't have to shoot or anything, but it's not bad to stand by it and give a little glance at it. Where are you going? How long will you be gone? What are your intentions? Are you thinking you want to marry my daughter? Those are good questions for first meeting. And here's why. If the answer to those is, well, if the answer is, well, marriage, well, I'm, I'm 14, you know. <laughs> the point is, why do people get together in the first place? And, and we need to know that just as Paul had a godly jealousy, having betrothed the Christians in Corinth to Jesus, dads, you should have that for your daughters. You shouldn't want anyone or anything to touch her that doesn't have the best and purest of intentions toward her. And listen, Song of Solomon, it's a strangest book, I got to tell you. I taught it three times. The first two times, the tapes didn't come out. I say tapes because this was a while back. There were no CDs back then. It's in the dark ages of cassettes. And uh, in any case, I taught it twice. Both times, the tapes didn't work. I always wondered, was that the enemy not wanting people to hear it, or was that God protecting people from my teaching? But... uh, In any case, I did it a third time, and then the computers crashed, and I'm like, okay, maybe God just doesn't want me teaching Song of Solomon. But in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, you see the brothers were committed to protecting the virginity of their sister. That was one of the roles and responsibilities of the father and the family in a generation and in a society where marriages were arranged. You wanted to present your daughter pure to the man who would spend the rest of his life with her. And that's what Paul is saying spiritually, that that we, his church, the bride of Christ. Listen, first time I ever heard a preacher talk about the bride of Christ, I was doing a concert, and a guy, it was an outreach, and it was in like Norwalk, and it was mostly bikers, and, uh, and so not Christian bikers, real bikers, not that you Christian bikers aren't bikers, but I mean scary bikers, and, and I remember we did the concert, and it was pretty bluesy and funky, and so they were grooving with us, and then the, the pastor got up there, and he's like, I want to talk to you today about how Jesus wants you to be the bride of Christ, And I'm looking at these guys and their body language, and they're like, I ain't going to be anybody's bride. And I'm like, I'm not sure that's the best evangelistic passage, but if you're not a Christian, don't misunderstand. It's a spiritual reality. There will be a wedding, the wedding feast of the Lamb. The church is the bride. Jesus is the groom. And Paul is telling the Corinthians, I've betrothed you. Now, that's more than engagement, but less than a wedding, less than a marriage. Because, well, it was a legal contract. If you were betrothed, the marriage had been arranged. If you wanted out of it, and that could only happen as a result of infidelity, of immorality. If you wanted out, there had to be a writing of divorce. Why? It was a legal proceeding. 
It was a legal contract. But once the marriage was consummated, and, and that actually happened physically during the week-long wedding feast, and these guys, they really had this figured out. You get the in-laws you want because you arrange the marriage. You have a week-long celebration. But listen, there was something in it for the kids too. The guy's got a year off work since everyone worked for dad. He's like, just take a year and enjoy your bride. Wouldn't you love that today? I tell you, if we were making that deal with our kids today, people wouldn't be waiting till 26 to get married. They'd all be married at 20 because they're like, hey, let's take the year now while we're young. Travel, enjoy the world. But in any case, Paul's saying, this is my heart, betrothing you. I, I, I've, I, I have a godly jealousy for you. I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, he says, verse 3, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted for the simplicity that is in Christ. This is the first of four major areas of concern that Paul expresses. And he uses Eve as the illustration. They're all familiar. Most of us are familiar. So we don't have to walk the territory except to say, when Satan tempted Eve, he didn't tempt her by saying, hey, you want to smoke this or drink this or go there or watch this or do that. His suggestion to her is she could be more spiritual by disobeying the Lord than by obeying the Lord. That she could become like God by disobeying the Lord. Oh, he didn't frame it like that. But what he did is he questioned the word and then he, he denied the word and he says, God's just trying to keep you from having all the experience life has for you. Yeah, God never wanted Adam or Eve or us to know sin experientially. They knew good. He never wanted them to know evil. And they chose, you see, oh, I know Eve was deceived, but she still chose to believe the enemy, to believe the lie. And the lie was you can be more like Jesus through your disobedience. You can be closer to God and more like God by doing what I'm suggesting instead of what God's saying. Well, you know the truth. There'd been no shame. There'd been no fear. There'd been no hiding. There'd been no accusations. There'd been no sin. And the moment they ate, they died spiritually. And all that flooded in, shame and guilt and blaming and all of that pain, all of that suffering passed on to their children. Do you realize that the first two kids born, one of them murdered the other? That's how long it takes for the human race to go from perfect fellowship to God to the worst thing that can be imagined, murder a between two brothers, first generation of sinners. So we shouldn't be surprised when someone opens fire in a theater or when someone blows people up in a bus stop or when, well, it's, it's the mindset of man today. Well, Paul's saying, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds could be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Listen, God creates, Satan corrupts. God blesses, Satan blasphemes. Everything God does, Satan is a counterfeiter. Satan is, well, an imitator. Why? He can't create anything. He can only corrupt God's creation. Well, he moves on to the other three areas of concern. He says... If he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, here's his concern, you may well put up with it. Listen, the occult and the cults have always attacked the person of Jesus. The primary attack had to do with his deity. It remains that today. In other words, in the first century and now in the 21st century, those caught up in the cults or in the occult who say they believe in Jesus. They actually have another Jesus. 
The Bible tells us that Jesus is the creator of all things. John 1 tells us in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He is deity. He is God. God the Son, yes, but nevertheless God. Colossians tells us all things were made by him and for him and in him all things consist. There's a lot to that. We'll get to it when we study Colossians. But just to say this, Jesus is deity and he is the creator. And this is always attacked by those who want to minimize Jesus or you couldn't say de-deify, could you? Well, I just said it. I don't know that you would ever say it, but I've certainly just said it. Well, think, that's why I do four services. Going to get it right at one of them. So in any case, they want to minimize who Jesus is and they want to maximize what they're expecting from people. Another Jesus, not only do they attack his person as it relates to his deity, some attack this person as it relates to his humanity. In other words, well, if he really is God, he couldn't really be a man. Let me suggest if he's not really God and not really man, he can't save us from our sins because the scriptures promised one who would be God with us. You shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. He's truly God. He's truly man. He is the creator and he is the only savior that we have or that will ever be. Now, they attack his person and then they attack the prophecies related to his person. Today, it's popular, believe it or not, among higher critics to say, well, does the virgin birth really matter? Have they read the Old Testament? The Old Testament said in Isaiah that he, the Messiah, the Savior, would be born of a virgin. That's how he enters into the world without the sin nature we've all inherited. Virgin birth is an absolute essential. Now, some will point out, so since it will happen, I want you to know, They'll say, well, listen, in the Old Testament, that word translated virgin can and is elsewhere translated young maiden. And while it's true, not every young maiden was a virgin. Most virgins were young maidens, at least at that time. And so here's the deal. When they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek more than 200 years before Christ, those who translated it, they understood that passage to be saying, the virgin shall be with child. And she will bear a son, and he will be called. You know the prophecy. So here's the point. They chose a word in Greek, and there were many to choose from that could only mean a virgin. So Paul's saying, I'm concerned because I'm your spiritual father, and I've betrothed you to Jesus, and I want to present you a chaste virgin. I don't want anyone to come and preach another Jesus and have you buy into the idea that he's not God, or that he didn't create, or that he wasn't virgin born, or that he didn't live a sinless life. That's another area of attack. Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father. The scriptures say, tempted and always yet without sin. Jesus was sinless. And listen, tempted and always yet without sin. I don't think we can begin to imagine what it would be like to feel the full brunt of temptation why because if we were faced with the greatest temptations as he was well many of the times we succumbed we gave in we failed Jesus never failed he always resisted that means he felt the full force of the temptation well in any case not just his his you know, reality of, of existing prior to creation since he is the creator of all things. And by the way, the cults will tell you, no, Jesus is a created being. One major cult has him as the spirit brother of Lucifer. You, listen, you can't be the creator of all the angels and be a spirit brother of an angel. Another cult has him as a god. I would suggest they should make sure that's a small g because there's only one true and living God. He is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, capital G. And so they are God. The three are one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word is Elohim. Do you know singular for God? 
is El, plural, Elohim. That's why it's a plural word. It's one God, but it's three persons. And you will find this consistent as you go through the entire scripture. So they deny he's a creator. Then they deny he was a man. If he, well, maybe he was just an apparition. Maybe he just appeared. No, he, he was a real man. That's the point of the virgin birth. And then sinless life, a vicarious death. That means he died for our sins. And that's the gospel. Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture. If you take his vicarious death, if you make his death anything less than for your sins and mine, well, then what was happening on the cross? He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So listen, not only miraculously born and sinlessly preserved, and then he dies for our sin, and, and then he rises again, in his own body, handle me, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see I have. Then he ascends into heaven where he is seated today at the right end of the Father and he promises to come again and establish his kingdom on this earth. This same Jesus, the angel said as he ascended into heaven and the disciples stared into heaven looking for him, he said this same Jesus will so come in like manner as you've seen him go. So he says, I'm concerned that you could buy into another Jesus, that you could receive a different spirit. Listen, we've received the spirit of God. We have received the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I won't leave you orphans. I'll send another comforter. That word another means another just like him. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he's just that. He's holy. That means his desire for us is to purify us. He is the spirit of truth, so he wants us to walk in the truth. He's the actual teacher. He's the reminder. He's the one who leads us and guides us, who convicts us and points us to the cross, the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm worried that you could take hold of another spirit, the spirit who deceives, the spirit who offers what he can't deliver, the spirit who comes not to give life, but, but as a counterfeit, a fake, a fraud. Well, or a different gospel, he says. Now listen, gospel means good news. Most of you are aware. So it's even troubling that we would say, well, you know, a different gospel. He uses it because he, he understands they're buying into it. They're thinking, well, this is good news. What were Paul's enemies saying? They were saying this whole Jesus thing, that's awesome. Believing in Jesus, wonderful. But you need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. We will deal with this in depth. We've touched on it in Romans. We've touched on it in Corinthians. We'll deal with it again. It is the major theme and subject of the book of Galatians. But the point is they're saying it's not enough to believe in Jesus. See, that's minimizing him again and then maximizing what you need to do. What did the scripture say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. They're saying, well, you can believe in Jesus, but now you need to be circumcised and you need to keep the law of Moses. And then it's like, well, which law? What law? And they're like, well, you know, the Ten Commandments. Well, okay. Well, and then there's this and then there's this. And the law is never ending, you see, that just goes on and on and on. And nobody ever keeps it, not successfully. So, so he's concerned about those who would bring the law, this gospel that you can say, be saved by keeping the law, or you can be saved by good works, or you can be saved by being a good person, or you could be saved by your good intentions. Listen, if any of that was true, if you could be saved through religion or by joining some group affiliation, then Jesus died in vain. Why? He said, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. He didn't pray it once. He didn't pray it twice. He prayed it three times. And then, listen, Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He went to the cross because he knew there's no other way for you to be saved, for me to be saved. So, the true gospel proclaims we're saved by grace through faith, 
that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. At the Passover, they were saved, the firstborn in every household, by the applying of blood, not believing that a lamb shed and blood applied could save you. You can believe that and still perish because you had to slay the lamb and you had to apply the blood or the firstborn in every household would die. Listen, it's the same thing. Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. I came down to give life. And he's talking spiritually, of course. The words I speak are spirit, he says, and they are truth. Well, Paul goes back and forth. As I mentioned, he starts with one issue. Now he moves back to, well, his issues with those who were opposing him. He says in verse 5, I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I'm untrained in speech, yet I'm not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge. Here's the problem. The Corinthian culture, very much as ours is today, was very class-oriented. What that means, if someone was in business or if someone was educated or if someone was a philosopher or they were a politician, the ones who rose to the top, well, they were exalted among the people. They were a higher class, you see. And because of that, they look at Paul and he's humble. And they look at Paul, and he doesn't charge anything to speak. Do you know that Paul is a contemporary of some of the great philosophers of the day? And, and, and people like Plato and Socrates and those others, they're, they're like, when they spoke, they charged. And the more famous you were, the more you charged. You know this is true today. The idea of higher education is you get as much education as you can. As you get more education, you'll make more money. And that's actually true if you can find a job. But the, the, the bottom line is, I think it was my friend Don Stewart. Oh, I, I know it was. He, he said his problem with education is a lot of people are educated beyond their intelligence. And, uh, and I, I think that that's true. You know, they, they're like, well, I don't know what they meant, but I can tell you what they said. No, you need to understand it. And so the person who's the professor, the person who's the philosopher, the person with the degrees, the person with the PhD, they're going to charge more. The bands, this is another illustration altogether. Bands call me and they want to come play at our services. And I'm like, well, what's your primary ministry? And they're like, what? And I'm like, they don't all say it like that, but more than you would think. What? And, and I'm like, well, do you minister primarily to the body or are you primarily an evangelistic band? Is your, do your songs reach out to the lost or do they build up the body? And they're like, well, I don't know. We just kind of play our songs. And I'm like, well, let me know how that goes and I'll talk to you later. Because we're not interested in someone showing up here to just play their songs. We want to worship. And if someone has the ability to reach out to the lost, well, then we'll go to the park and, and do an outreach. But the point is we should know. And, and ironically, not everybody who charges the most, even in Christian music, has the best ministry. Now, I'm not saying if someone makes a living in the ministry, that's wrong. Paul says if anyone preaches the gospel, they should live from the gospel. But Paul himself would never charge anyone. Why? Well, he was a pioneer, and he didn't want anyone boasting and saying, yeah, we made that happen. Yeah, we were supporting Paul. He could have never done it without us. He didn't charge when he was in Corinth. When he went to Macedonia, he didn't charge. But when he came back to Corinth, the Macedonians said, we got to support this guy. Well, here's the problem. Paul's detractors, Paul's enemies, the fakes, the frauds, the counterfeits, they were coming to town, as we saw last time, letters from Jerusalem. We're highly recommended. And by the way, we charge quite a bit to share. And they're like, oh, they charge quite a bit. They must be important. Letters from the apostles. Whoa, that's something. And then they're saying, and what about Paul? He works. I don't know if you're aware of it. The Greeks weren't real fond of work. That's what they thought servants and slaves were for. For real. They thought life was all about just sitting around and philosophizing and, and going to the public baths. And they had them. 
and, and just, you know, it, it was just such a weird mindset. So if somebody worked really hard, they looked down on them. Paul worked really hard. He worked with his own hands. He made tents. It made you get in the dirt. It made you work with your hands. You had tools. You came with your toolkit. And listen, there should never be anything in anyone's mind demeaning about hard work. Because however God enables us to provide for ourselves and our families and those in need around us, that's to be honored. It's honorable. But these guys thought, look, if he was a real apostle, would he be working like that? Wouldn't he be like these other guys? I mean, they got to be put up in the nicest place, and, and they got to have a certain diet, and they want the air conditioner or a certain temperature. I know they didn't have air conditioning, but, but people do that today. Guest speaker, yeah, can you make sure the air's at this certain range? I said, I can make sure the air doesn't work. But uh, <laughs> the point is, I'm not saying those guys are going to speak here either. So the point again is this. They were demeaning Paul because he worked with his own hands to provide for his own needs so he wouldn't have to charge them. And they looked at that and said, well, maybe he's not even an apostle. I mean, that's what these other guys are saying. He seemed genuinely embarrassed, by the way, at the support he'd received from those he'd led to Christ elsewhere. As I mentioned, the Macedonians are supporting him. Listen how he describes their gifts. I robbed other churches taking wages from them to minister to you. He considers it, well, demeaning to take wages, while the others thought it would be demeaning not to get them. And so I know Paul didn't literally rob churches. It is just showing his mindset and his heart. These were his kids. He's like, the parents should provide for the kids, not the kids for the parents. He said, when I was, in pres when I was present with you, verse 9, and in need, I was a burden to no one. What I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. So I will keep myself as the truth of Christ is in me. No one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Others boasted in how much they were making. Paul boasted in the fact that he didn't ever charge to preach the gospel why, he says, because I don't love you? God knows. But what I do, I will continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. The truth is, the Macedonians gave willingly, generously, sacrificially. We talked about that kind of giving a couple weeks back because it was the theme of the passage. And that's what God's looking for in us. If we're going to support this work or missionaries out on the field, we want to do it willingly, generously, sacrificially. And, and in any case, he's, he's just saying, look, his motivation for ministry it was love, love for God who saved him, love for the people who needed to be saved. It was love that was motivating him. Now, he mentions again those he calls false apostles. The word means counterfeit. And here's the problem with the counterfeit preacher or pastor or apostle. They preach a counterfeit gospel and produce a counterfeit congregation. Counterfeit Christians. So what you have is this, this whole thing that looks just like the real thing. Listen, I understand the appeal of the cults to people, especially the family-oriented cults. Not all of them are, by the way. But the family-oriented cults, I understand the appeal because if you were married to a drug addict or you were married to a drunk or you were married to someone who was violent, out of control, and they met somebody and they went and they, they're like, man, look at these, this is families and it's like you can clean this up and you can do that and we have this program and we have this for the kids. All that just looks good. And, and listen, the cults do actually get some people sober. And they do actually get some people away from drugs. And they do get people's families together. But the problem is, when it comes to Christ, they have a counterfeit. So they can do a lot in the natural, and they do it, many of them, effectively. I take nothing away from that. But when it comes to spirituality, they still don't have it. 
Because if you got the wrong Jesus and the wrong gospel, then, then you're going to have a wrong outcome. It can look good. And our intention, our goal, and by our, I mean the pastors, the, the leaders, the elders of Calvary Chico, the Sunday school teachers, hey, that includes many of you, those who serve here. It's not just that people would look different, but be different. We don't want to focus on the outside. Hey, you need to look this way and act this way and talk this way because you could get down the look and the act and the, and the talk. But, but it's like it's reality. It's a transformation. It's God transforming us, God transforming you. Well, he says these guys are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves. See, that's the key. God wasn't changing them. These weren't even the cool kind of transformers like the, the, the ones in the movie. These are fakes and frauds. As I mentioned, posers and pretenders, false apostles, he calls them. Deceitful workers transforming themselves. False apostles, listen, Jeremiah dealt with this issue in his day. They weren't called apostles. They were called prophets. But really, a prophet was sent from God with a message for the people. That's what an apostle is, someone sent from God with a message for the people. And listen to Jeremiah's as he cites the problem back in his day. I believe it applied perfectly in Paul's to the very people he's addressing, and I see it all around us in our day. Jeremiah writing as the Lord speaks to him. This is God actually speaking. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them. Yet they prophesied. They came saying, thus says the Lord. And God says, I never spoke to them. But if they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. That's Jeremiah 23, 21 and 2. And in Jeremiah 23, 30, for time's sake, and you should read all of Jeremiah 23 and familiarize yourself with it. Therefore, he says, I'm against... The prophet, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. I'm against the prophet, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says, behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. In Jeremiah's day, judgment was coming and the people were saying, peace, peace. And Jeremiah's like, no, no. You know what they did? They put him in prison. And then they, one thing after another, he was the most rejected person ever in the ministry. And, and, and well, in Paul's day, they were saying, no, listen, some were saying it's the law. Others were saying it's licensed to sin. You come to Christ, you live any way you want. Jesus is saying no, and Paul's saying no. You can't continue in your sin and be saved from sin. And you can't add to what Jesus has done on the cross by the law or works or any other thing. He calls them not only false prophets, but deceitful workers. I was reminded of the counterfeiters Back in the day of Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron come. They throw down the rod because they're like, well, we got to have a sign. And they like, throw down the rod. It becomes a serpent. What do Pharaoh's magicians do? They say, hey, we got this. They throw down their rods and they become serpents too. Now, they're magicians. That means they do magic. Usually, magic is just trickery. It's possible that it was supernatural in nature. But it's just as possible that it was some kind of a trick, you see. Here's what we know for sure, that God's rod ate their rods. Those serpents ate up by God's serpent. And then the water turns to blood. Dip your rod in the water, and the water turns to blood. Pharaoh's magicians say, hey, we can do that. And then there's frogs everywhere. And Pharaoh's magicians say, we can do that. I'm thinking at this point, if I'm Pharaoh, I'm like, well, I'd like to see you get rid of the frogs or purify the water. How do I, what, I need more frogs? I need more impure water? You see, these guys could either counterfeit the work of God, and again, I can't tell you, was it really supernatural or were they just magicians, just tricking? 
Either way, here's what we're sure of. They could not resist the true work of God. They could not reverse the true work of God when it came to the lice. Well, lice comes on all the man and beast, and, and Pharaoh's magicians say, we can do that, and they're like, oh, wow, we can't do that. And I'm thinking at this point, Pharaoh's like, thank God, although I doubt he said that. But, but uh, the bottom line is, you don't need someone to add to your misery if you're in misery. You need someone who can help you out of your misery. And Pharaoh's magicians, they had nothing to offer. Why? They were deceitful workers. They were counterfeiters. And here's what they end up saying. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. They had to acknowledge their impotence. We can't resist it. We can't reverse it. And we can't even fake this or counterfeit this or duplicate this. Transforming themselves, Paul said, unrepentant, unconverted, religious, but unrighteous. They were either lost or they were liars or they were both. Like Judas who followed our Lord, who learned from our Lord, who was sent out by our Lord, who preached the message that can save from sin but never responded to it himself. That's what he's talking about here. And then he concludes, and we will as well. And no wonder, he says, verse 14, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. You see, God made Satan perfect, but Satan rebelled. And then Satan encouraged Adam and Eve's rebellion. He continues to encourage that in us. He doesn't give up on us when we come to Christ. He wants to make us unfruitful. High maintenance, low impact Christians. God has an opposite plan for us. Satan transforms himself. And what does he do? He presents himself. He counterfeits. He masquerades as an angel of light. This causes me to be concerned about these stories. And you hear them, the books that are published, the people who go on TV and talk about their near-death experience or their death experience and they're brought back and there's a new book and it's the latest rage. And listen, I'm not saying it can't be true. But what I'm saying is I'm concerned because it isn't just Christians who claim to go toward the light. I've done enough research that I can tell you People who don't believe in Jesus, who are caught up in completely different worlds, spiritually or, or religiously, they say, man, I, I was going toward the light, and it was beautiful, and it was glorious, and all of a sudden, I was back. Listen, what I want to suggest to you is fire produces light. And Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And there may be light at the end of the tunnel, but you don't know the source of that light. And you want to make sure you're headed toward the light of the world. The one who says, he who follows after me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He says, it's no great thing, verse 15, if his ministers, yeah, he can't create Satan, can't create. So he, he watches what God does. God creates people and uses people. He says, oh, I can use people. And he does it effectively. He sees how effective God is using people, and he says, I can use people. And how? They transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. They preach a righteousness they can't produce. We can make you right with God, affiliate with us, be baptized into our group or our church or our cult, although few call it a cult. But, but uh, you know, follow us or knock on the doors or pass out the literature or be a good person or try harder here. He says their end will be according to their works. So the question today is simple. Are you in the process of transformation? And if so, who's doing the transforming? Is God transforming you by the renewing of your mind? Or are you simply trying to transform yourself? Some people show up at church for that very reason. You may have come knowing that well, you weren't going to see the movie Transformers, but you're like, I want to be transformed. And I need the information that I can process to be a better dad or a better husband or a better whatever. And listen, you can get that from the Bible and you can get that in these studies. But unless you get Jesus, you'll still be separated from God eternally. Paul in Romans 12 
It says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And stop being conformed to this world, but be being transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Lord, 